Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 37. A special Sukkot edition on Simcha and Joy. I'm sure that all our tefillahs were received yesterday on Yom Kippur for Gmar Chassim Teva, Mashon Teva Masuka, which is why we sing that victory song and the march, Napoleon's march at the end of Ne'ila, because it symbolizes that we have definitely been victorious and triumphant in all our prayers. And now the transition begins from the Yom Neroyim, the first half of the month of Tishrei, into the second half of the month of Tishrei, which is Simcha. So Yom Neroyim, as the words imply, are days of awe. Neira, Neira, Oyim Neira. The second half of the month is days of Simcha, Yemei Simcha starting from the 15th of the month, exactly when the full moon, which is the first night of Sukkot, which will be this coming Wednesday night. Chassidus has a beautiful and poetic way of explaining it, using the Pesach and Shir Hashirim, Smele taches l'reshi, yumini techapkeni. Your left hand is beneath my head, and your right hand embraces me, hugs me. That the left hand is talking about Gvura Yira, is the first half of the month, where uh, we stand in awe and in uh, accountability to the purpose of our lives, the mission of our lives. And then comes the second half of the month, which is Yemini Tachab Keni, Yemini is Chesed, Chesed and Simcha, where all that which we experienced during the first half of the month comes out now revealed in an exuberant joy. Because even the first half of the month, remember, even to Sashem B'Simcha, serving God with joy is not just when we're on Purim and on Simcha's Teda, but also all year round. Even when you have Yiddish Shamayim, it's also one of the mitzvahs. Even when you have fear and awe of God, I specifically use the word awe, not fear, because fear is so often misunderstood and being associated with things like being afraid of a thief or being afraid of the night or being afraid of a crime and so on. So awe seems to be a much better word, a much more uplifting word. Even that also has to be done with joy. However, as Chassidus explains, Vigilu Barada, Vigilu Barada. Then the celebration, the Gilu's Barada, is with trembling. Example used, when you're standing before a king, even though you may be deeply inside, unbelievably happy, the fact that the, the gift, the honor, the ability to be able to stand before the great king, but you don't start making somersaults and you don't start singing and dancing in front of a king. The simcha is gilu barada. It's wrapped within an uh, element of awe and respect, though there's total joy within. Then comes sukkis, and then the gilu comes out revealed. When you leave the king's palace, the king's presence, then what do you do? You celebrate big time in the most revealed possible way. And that itself is a tremendous psychological lesson in life of the balance, the dance, in every relationship between people, between spouses, between parents and children, between friends, communities, all model are modeled after the relationship between us and God, which is it requ- always requires two elements, that dance. Number one, an element of respect, an element of recognizing others' space. Not just we're all one and everything is happy-go-lucky, but at the same time, also the ability to join together in a unbridled joy. So you need both gvura and chesed. You need both an element of discipline, and at the same time you also need that joy. And in that order, you begin first with kabbalos el machos shemaim. First, this element of humility, of uh, modesty, recognizing there's something greater than you. Why? Because if you start dancing right away, it often can be border on a certain type of self indulgence, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why. I am Kippur, everything is bichashoy, silent. Because it says by Matan Teir, it was all big fanfare, fireworks. It was a light and sound show. There was, there was thunder, there was lightning. It was with a whole rash, the whole world trembled and thundered with the Shem Ezla Ami Yitim when the Ibshta gave the Teir by Matan Teir. But then what happened was the Chet Egel. It was like an Ayin Hara, when you, make, you dance too much, and it's too much in the public eye, so to speak. It also attracts the negative forces who say, hey, one second, do they deserve it? Uh, it challenges the, the right to be so happy. So the Ebrister said, the second time I give the luchas, this time it will be quietly, 
humbly, modestly. Koyal de Mamadaka. That doesn't make the joy less. It doesn't make the simcha less. It just means that it's done in a subdued way. And then Sukkot comes, and it is, does explode. But because it was preceded by the humility, you're far more assured that it'll be a checked simcha. It'll be a simcha meter bitl, not a simcha from Hidalus, which is not just a person just wanting to be, express themselves and wanting to be happy, but it'll be a simcha that is tempered and driven and fueled by a sense of humility, and therefore the simcha too becomes part of the person's humility. Small introduction just in this transition that we're in right now. It's also interesting that until today, the day after Yom Kippur, the Friedrich Rebbe asked the Rebbe Rashab, what do we do now? And the Rebbe Rashab famously answered, Itzadaf Menesh Tshuvata. Which of course begs the question, didn't we just do 10, 10 days of Tshuva? Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Before that, a month of El, also Tshuva, Tshuva Tata, and so on. What was meant as Shuvatan? So the obvious answer is that when you climb the ladder, you climb the mountain, as you get to higher levels, you recognize there's even more subtle things. That's why we say Hashem, we say, uh, we say Tachnun after Shemin Esedek. See, this explains, because when you get to a higher level, then even things before that may not have been a blemish, now relatively becomes like a blemish, like a dust on the, on the, on the eyeball. A dust on the finger you don't feel. But when you get to the higher level of a higher state of consciousness, a higher state of awareness, then every little thing matters, and therefore, a higher level of truth. But you can also say, like it says in Chassidus, in Tanya, in Gersak Tshuva, that Tshuva Allah is Simcha. So you can say there's the Tshuva that you do, wiping away the dust and cleaning up your act and cleaning up your life in order to be able to bring in a fresh new year. So you can say the tshuva till then is primarily tshuva tata, even though it says Rosh Hashanah says he made tshuva and Yom Kippur is also tshuva ilah. But when do you really see the expression of tshuva ilah and the simcha of the tshuva ilah? Because tshuva ilah, as Chassidus explains, is not just cleaning up the dust. It's the matter of being ruach tosh tshuva lekim asher Is the idea of that the spirit reconnects to its source. That's that's a cause for great joy. That celebration comes out sukkahs. And when does the sukkahs begin? The chonis, the preparations begin right here. Lechachtem lechem b'yeh marishin begins uh, right now in the four days before sukkahs, as the medrash, as the rebbe always brings. Lechachtem lechem b'yeh marishin rishin lechesh benavenis. That four days, because Jews are involved in mitzvahs, in finding an esrig and gathering the tilas dalad minim, gathering the four species, they're still so preoccupied. There's no time for anything else. So this is the period where it's at the higher level of tshuva, which is the tshuva of reconnecting to your source. Tshuva, the real meaning of tshuva from the word return. With that small introduction, let me go to a whole bunch of questions that came in about the topic of joy and simcha on a personal level, on a collective level, and address that. And, um, and some other topics that uh, we designated for this week, which all surround, in general terms, this theme of joy as we go into sukkahs, uh, in the next few days. But I want to begin with reading a beautiful note that I received, which I wanted to share with you, um, feedback. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, of all weekly video classes, your last one on forgiveness, referring to last week's pre-Yom uh, Kippur, especially Yom Kippur and forgiveness edition, clearly and practically affected me the most. I've been trying to release a grudge for almost 40 years, and like some who wrote in their questions, did not succeed in letting go of that last point of irritation. But then I heard what was for me the most important line to hear. For some reason I had to go through this, and I've learned from it, and I let it go. I was jolted into a good headspace when I heard the class the first time. On my second listening, I really heard the words that I've learned from it. Right away a thought came to me as to what I can learn from it. It was so obvious, and I now feel that I can let it go. Should the thought come up again, I intend to say to it, but I already let this go. The two words, thank you, are utterly inadequate to express my appreciation for the service that you are so generously and expertly providing. Gmach So I'm very touched and moved. Thank you very much, whoever this writer is. And um, I shared it because I believe that it's also an opportunity to invite all of you to ask your questions completely anonymously and confidentially, as well as send any comments in at Meaningful Life dot com forward slash my life live we've also now set up a page there the same uh, hyperlink the same url 
but with the, the word dedicate. So if you want to dedicate this episode or any other episode in the future, please just go there. It's MeaningfulLife.com forward slash my life live slash forward slash dedicate and uh and, and dedicate dot php to be exact and uh, please help us continue this it's a great way to honor anyone that you a loved one or uh, either honor them or the memory of them and um and that honor may these these classes and these programs who help so many people including myself um be a merit a schus for them and that and their neshama should be a schus for us with that said let's continue to a few questions question number one chronic complainer lately i've come to the realization that i'm a negative person i always see the flaws in people and find reasons to kvetch either about a person or a situation as sukkahs comes up is there a way to truly internalize this joy to have a shift in perspective in my day-to-day life. Question number two. Is enjoying life a contradiction to being a chassid? I'm very dedicated to trying to be a chassid and serve Hashem. I also am very aware of my animalistic side. I want to enjoy the food I eat and other pleasures. When in life, am I meant to just relax and enjoy? I always see, feel an immense amount of pressure to turn over the world and bring Mashiach now. And guilt whenever I'm relaxing and enjoying life's pleasures, since in those moments I feel apathetic about Kedusha. Is there any way I'll pick scissors that I can enjoy my life? Okay. Question number three. Question, or can be a comment. Secular life and secular psychology is all about a person's well-being. Any sense of purpose is defined by whether it brings personal fulfillment and well-being. I'm familiar with a woman in my shlichus who was perfectly happy in her marriage but got divorced because the therapist told her that this marriage is limiting her. This is obviously an extreme case. Chesidus life, conversely, is about using that well-being for a higher purpose. Life is about serving Hashem. Too often, this constant drilling of life is not about well-being. It is about purpose gets misinterpreted to mean you're not defined by who you are, but by what you do. This is, of course... This, of course, is the epitome of insecurity and invalidity, invalidation, and often leads to ignoring oneself and even suppressing it. Eventually, the individual becomes depressed or frustrated and finds different outlets for relief. For the first time, he hears that he is something and he's being va- and, he's, and that he's feeling validated, finding the peace he longs for so badly. He then sees it as a contradiction to everything he was brought up with. Is life about well-being, or better said, is life about who you are, or is life about what you do? Of course, in truth, there is no contradiction. Chassidus spares no words in describing the inherent value of a yid, and how his connection to Hashem does not depend on, is not defined by what he does. Life is about using your healthy self for a purpose. To put it in your words, healthy is when there is no friction between who you are and what you do. People really need to feel validated again and again. A door is very weak. Okay, it's not phrased as a question, but I shall definitely comment on this. Question. Question number four. Irrational fears. I am Baruch Hashem, a happy person in general, and thank God I have a lot to thank Hashem for. However, and maybe because of this, I often find myself imagining the worst case scenarios happening, Chaz B'Shalom. Looking around the world at all the unfortunately sad things that happen, it's hard not to imagine the what ifs, God forbid. This obviously leads to feelings of fear and sadness. Am I just being a Yiddish imam or is there something to do? Question number five. I'm piling these questions together simply because it's easier to talk about them in, all in, a, in a group rather than, even though they're very different questions, but I, I think it's be more productive to do it together, even though the questions definitely have different uh, nuances and even different avenues. I've been going through a personal struggle for some time now, I'm not so happy with my life. I'm really unhappy in my marriage. First thing is because I don't respect my husband. I'm not sure I really even love him. My question is this. Do I need to stay married to my husband if there is no like, love, or respect? We have a child, so it makes things more complicated, but I'm not sure what to do. One more question, and then we will go to my response. Question six. How do I maintain my identity and be at peace with my, 
of myself without the fear of being criticized and stigmatized by others. I want to be happy with myself, yet after going through the system and having humble chassidish parents, I have a little voice inside that is always whispering that I, if I let go and just be okay with the way I am, I'll be too bold, too colorful, not bitl. For some reason I find myself judging chassidim that are leaders and outspoken because I was taught the value of the humble, quiet, quiet chassid, and I can't let go of this image. But I'm not being myself and sticking around people like-minded and avoiding those who have managed to find their voice. I am judgmental and critical of them. I see people like you and your brother that are very self-confident and still respected by many and still the voice is calling and saying, who says that they are the ultimate humble chassid? Please help. Okay. Always puts you in a quandary when you have to speak about comments on yourself. So, uh, But we'll do try to do the best in addressing all these issues. And I want to throw in a few more questions on my, on my own that I've heard from people uh, verbally, orally, instead of in writing, and uh, that I think also fit into this whole picture. And that comes down to the general question, how can we live a true joy? What is the meaning of sukkahs? Can you just turn on and press a button and say, okay, now it's time to be besimcha? What happens if you're not in the mood? or you're down, or you're depressed about something. And the truth is, what really is simcha? What is simcha? We know it's a clear mitzvah, ivdus Hashem b'simcha. And we say, tachas Hashem lo'yavadat b'simcha v'tuv le'vo, the Alter Rebbe brings in chapter 26 in Tanya, that you do it to everyone, the Pirush of the Arizal on this, that it's such a severe crime not to be besimcha, that the crime is not the not doing the mitzvah, not do, doing the mitzvahs, but if you don't do it with joy. So what exactly is joy and simcha? We also know that chassidus, Baal Shem Tov, one of the fundamental foundations of chassidus was simcha, as the Baal Shem Tov emphasized time and again. What exactly was he emphasizing? What was, what, what was the attitude to joy before the Baal Shem Tov came around? And why is it such a fundamental principle? I think addressing this from all these different angles is the key to also helping answer the questions that were asked and many of our own questions because, as we'll see in a moment, joy and simcha is not some uh, adjunct. It's not some addendum, an additional point. It lies at the heart of the entire relationship we have with God, with ourselves, with others. It lies at the heart of success in life in every possible way. So the mere fact that we're told that it's not just an additional mitzvah, that you have mitzvahs, and then you also do it in joy. But it becomes so fundamental that everything be done with joy tells you that this has something much more powerful than just... Like for example, you say mitzvahs should be done with kavana. But there are mitzvahs even without kavana, even without intention, that you, you, you fulfill the mitzvah. There are mitzvahs by kavana. There, there's the whole different two opinions. Do mitzvahs need kavana? Do no. The mere fact that there's another opinion that doesn't need kavana intention tells you it's not integral to the mitzvah. There are mitzvahs, as I just mentioned, that absolutely, like korbanis, offerings, tefillah b'lei kavanah is like a body without a soul. So the discussion is it still it means something even you know, better than nothing is body without a soul. Then there are mitzvahs like tzedakah, for example. Even though kavanah intention has tremendous dimension, someone does it with joy, someone does it with a smile, all the levels the Rambam, Maimonides, spells out in how, do, how to give tzedakah. But we know also if you give tzedakah, even if you give it with a sour face, even if you give it on a condition to help save my child's life. Even if, as the Sifri says, you lose a penny, you lose a coin, and someone finds it, Hama'avid Sela, and someone finds it, and can use it. And would you know that someone had found it, you would say, I don't want to give it to them, I don't want to give this charity? It's still considered a mitzvah, because the bottom line, the bottom line, the nefesh the spirit of the, the life, and the spirit of a poor person was helped, it doesn't matter what your intention is. But simcha, we don't say that. Simcha, we say, Because you did not serve God with joy, all kinds of negative things are a result of that. As I mentioned from the Tanya, and Pei Dechavov, from the Ariza. So clearly, Ivdus Hashem B'Simcha. Sukkos, of course, as the Rebbe explains, that there's many levels of simcha. All year round, we have the mitzvah to do everything with joy. When it comes, Man Simcha Seinu. In addition to regular moyedim le simcha, all moyedim have simcha in them. Even Shabbos has, uh, uh, 
Yem Simchaschem, Ela Shabosis. Rosh Hashanah, Yem Kippur also have an element of Simcha, but then there's Man Simcha Seinu within Moedim the Simcha itself. So clearly the joy is within the joy, even a greater, more emphasis. That's the Shar, that's the gate. Whereas, for example, Pesach is also Moedim the Simcha, but we say it's Man Cheder Seinu, time of our freedom. Shavuos is Moedim the Simcha, but it's Zman Matan Teder Seinu. Sukkot is Moedim the Simcha, and also Zman Simcha Seinu. And then the Simcha is Beis Hashem and then there's a Simcha connected with Samachtim, connected to the the Natilas Dalad Minim, the taking of the four species. And then Sukkot itself it grows day by day, to get to Yishan Rabbish, Minyat Tzeda, Simchas Teda. All this indicates that Simcha is all year round, but in this period of time, as I discussed earlier, it's even more emphasis, which is why we're discussing it in the first place. So what is this thing about Simcha that's so important? So let's go to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, even though there are many, you say this, foundations of Chassidus, but generally speaking, you hear primarily about five main foundations in Chassidus. Number one, from the Baal Shem Tov, that is. The Alta Reb, of course, developed it further. But the five principles are, not in any order of priority, is number one, that everything is Bajgach Pratis. Everything is divine providence. Number two, that everything is a lesson in Avedis Hashem. Everything a person sees or hears. Number three, simcha, as I just said, joy. Number four, the idea of hisavas b'chol rega. Perpetual creation, as the Alter Rebbe brings in Shari Yechud Vamuna, of Peter Shabal Shemtev, and Le'elam Hashem Dvar Chanitzu B'Shemayim, that God's word stands forever in heaven, as we say in Davening, Amachadosh B'Tu B'chol Yem Tomid Maise B'Reshis, that this literally means, literally, a constant perpetual creation, every second anew. And of course, the fifth, Avis Yisrael, the love of every single Jew. These are the five you hear about when you talk about the Yisaitis or the Gilui, the Chidushim of the Baal Shem Tov. Now interestingly, all of them were known before. Even Ashgach HaPratis, their opinions, whether it was uh, every detail, the Rambam, there's the famous uh, discussions on this matter, but there, there were opinions. The Rebbe has a famous letter on it and printed at the end of his office of Chelik Ches, where he talks about the different opinions before the Baal Shem Tov. But the other idea, Simcha, Avis Yisrael, his Savas B'chol Rebbe, Rebbe even, is Medrash Tilim, the Rebbe brings it. And the Taichus of Pirush of Baal Shem Tov, Pirush means, Baal Shem Tov, Fanandi Gishpreit. Pirush also means, not just interpret, Pirush means to Fanandi Gishpreit, to spread out your wings. He spread it to the entire world. So regardless, that's a whole different discussion, but the Baal Shem Tov definitely added emphasis in each one of them, that until that point was not emphasized enough. Or maybe you can say it was emphasized in the time in the earlier years. But in the later years, when, the, when it says Yisrael was Beisalfus in a state of faint, the Baal Shem Tov came and revived, and these are the foundations. Interestingly, if you think about it, all five are connected. They're all about one thing. About looking at the soul instead of the body of something. Instead of looking at the surface, to look beneath the surface. So let's start with, the, I'll go in the order that I said. You know, actually, I want to start with Hisavas B'chol Rega. What is the point? You look around at a world around you, it can seem like Le'yush Beisu. Nothing changes. Sun rises every morning, the moon in the evening, sun sets, day and night, the cycles of the seasons, the nature, nature and all its laws of nature. And it can seem like, you know, it's a type of like a clock work type of machine that's just rolling along without, nothing changes. As the cynics like to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Comes the Baal Shem Tov's no, or Pirush. And this becomes the whole Yisod of Shari Yuchad Vamuna. That every second the world is created anew. It's a dynamic universe. Fascinatingly, this has been corroborated today scientifically. We know this now that the world is not inanimate. Even an empty room is filled with pulsating energy of subatomic particles. What Chassidus obviously emphasizes is that this is being renewed from the source. So the source. The energy is flowing from the source, constantly renewing existence every moment. Why is this so important? Because number one, it teaches us that the universe is completely dependent, as he explains in Shaykh Vamuna, on its life force. It has no validity of its own. But then, of course, the Rebbe's Machadish in a number of Sikhs, that God could have, in his infinite power, just invested, just infused the world with a power. That would go like Shalhevus Elamela. That was the Rebbe expressed himself, Shabbos Dvarim Chazain Tov Shin Mem. Like a flame that rises on its own. Why didn't he do that? 
He didn't do that because one of the explanations that Rebbe gives is because he wanted to have an ongoing relationship. Think of love just going into automatic pilot. And you know what? You, you put on the switch once, you press a button, and that's the rest of your life. No, the Abishta wanted a renewed relationship every moment. That every moment there's a, there's a connection made. Every moment is a moment of hope. Things don't work out, you're right away connected to the source. You don't have to wait for who knows when, when you're going to get back to the source of energy. There's much more that can be said, but the point is that the universe is completely connected all the time to its source. The fact that we don't see or feel it is due to our own blindness. But like he says in Shariah HaLemun, for one second God chooses to not breathe, to not will the universe, it stops being. The famous discussion, the debate between uh, Baal Nigla and Baal How would God destroy the universe? So the Baal Nigla starts bringing the rayas, very clear. It says in the Torah, he would first bring a mabel, a flood, then he'd bring a fire, and spread all the ashes all over. So the world would cease to be. The Chassid said, very simple, what would God do if he wanted to destroy the universe, God forbid? He would do one thing only, nothing. He'd stop speaking. He'd stop breathing. He'd stop willing. Because the universe is, is completely dependent on its source of energy. Which brings us to the same point of Hashgach Pratis and learning a lesson from everything you see and hear. Why is that so fundamental? Because it means that everything has purpose. It's not like, okay, the machine was put into motion and now it's working on its own. No. Every second, every encounter, every place you go, a leaf turns over. It just was now perpetually created, this moment. So of course it's divine providence. <clears throat> and therefore there's a lesson that you have to learn from it. Avis Yisrael is a similar idea. How do you love every person? Because you see the soul in the person, as he explains in Tanya, Periklamit Beis, that nafshe ikir and gufi tof. If you worship the body, the matter, material, over the soul, then you can never have true love. Love is about transcendence of soul over body. Why, why is the foundation all of the Torah? And this leads me to Simch. This leads us to the discussion of Simch. Simch is not, as many assume, just some type of action. You're doing an act, and now you're told, do it with joy. Simch lies at the heart of our entire essence of our beings, and who we are, and how we were created. We were created Simchadikah souls. A soul is a piece of God sent to this world to fulfill a mission. How could a soul not have simcha from that? So a soul is naturally connected to the divine. And that natural connection, by virtue of that, there's always joy. The concept that we have that there's joy and there's sadness is because we live in a world we've become overwhelmed and overcome by the vicissitudes and ups and downs of life. So I'm in a good mood, I'm in a bad mood, I'm sad. A, a, a soul, by, a, by essentially, is always besimcha. If it's lacking simcha, it's only because it hasn't reached the highest level of spirituality or divine connection that it can achieve. Now you'll say, of course, uh, if that's the case, the soul in heaven is that way. What about when a soul comes down to earth? Okay, so here we have, the soul does have to be compelled to come down. And there is definitely a painful element to it. But when the soul recognizes and knows that this is what God wants, it ultimately embraces it, even though every second that the soul is on earth, it's always it's always yearning, like a flame, to go back to its source. But then, the soul does not want to leave. Why? Because of the mitzvahs, and the great nachas. One hour, in this world, with all the pain, because this is God's purpose. And when you're connected to your purpose, there's always natural simcha, natural joy. So the first thing we have to understand with simcha, simcha is not some option. It's not some um, optional, superimposed element. It lies at the heart of our entire existence. The mere fact that you're connected to your source every second is a source of joy. When you feel that you're on your own, you feel lonely, you feel disconnected, you don't feel you belong, that's where all despondence and sadness comes from. Now it's a challenge. That's why we have a mitzvah. And that's why you have to have mitzvah. Why? Because when this world is very easy to become blind. Even though everything I just said makes sense, that's in the mind. The mind understands it. But just like to remember that every second is everything is Ashraqa Pratis, that everything is, is controlled by the divine plan and divine hand, that everything is a lesson in your life. 
that every, the creation is perpetual, that you should look at the soul and everything going on, all that takes work. Because the material world, my friends, is a very powerful, seductive force. that never forget that. It all comes back to the big Tzimtzum Harishan, where God concealed His presence, created an agnostic universe, and does not allow us to see that connection to the source. And that's hence what the Baal Shem Tov and the Alta Rebbe and all the Chassidus and all the Rabbeim came to wake us up to a reality that on our own we can easily forget and be blinded to. A person will not sin. Let's define it more specifically. Eivara Veda, as I've interpreted a number of times from Chassidus, Aveda comes from the word Havara Mereshus Mereshus. A person does not become displaced, does not become disconnected unless there's a moment of blindness, a moment of insanity that doesn't let them see. You don't see the source. Who sees Hanelud, as Chassidus says, sees the birthing. Sees how everything is being birthed, Na'ayin Basa, like the Mishnah says, from where it comes. Everything is being birthed right now. That is the source of all Betachim, of trust and all Amuna. Because you know that you're always connected to the source. I, you don't see it. You recognize that my not seeing it doesn't mean I'm not connected. And that's the work of life. That's why Simcha is not some addendum. Simcha lies at the heart. It's the heart. It's the Simcha of the, of the Neshama knowing that it's fulfilling what God wants. dependent on someone else literally they might as boss of a dumb as soon as you're dependent on someone else you can never have full joy because you're always worried maybe that one will take it away maybe they won't give me all of it when you recognize that it's an inherent it's your life it's your it's your birthright your god-given right because of your 
by merit and virtue of your own soul, then it's something that no one can ever take away. This, frankly, is one of the ways that we help heal when we grow up in homes that are abusive or dysfunctional. And our parents <clears throat> did not nurture and validate this natural <clears throat> love and this natural simcha and joy. One of the ways is to come to realize that they don't have the ability to take it away from you. It was given to you by God. There's work to be done to reconnect. So when you go to Tanya now, the chapters where he starts talking about Simcha and Atzvus, when he makes it very clear why it's so fundamental, because this is a key to all of life, that you have everything in your soul that you need to fulfill and face any challenge. And that's why you can have the power and confidence to battle with anything that comes your way. You lose that confidence, that alone undermines your effort. So simcha is a state of being more than just an act. Sukkot is a time when that state of being emerges because after Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, where we're renewed and we're reconnected to the source of our soul, which is on uh, Yom Kippur, Yechidah Sheben Nefesh, to the source itself, Yechidah Liyagdach. So then when it comes Sukkot, it's a natural. Now I'm celebrating my, my etzim being, the mere fact that I exist. Shechiyonu v'kimonu v'giyonu l'zman hazeh great source of joy. So let's put it into practical terms. We'll say, okay, very nice concept. Practical terms means it's about where you're focusing your life. You're going to focus on material success. You're going to focus on temporary achievements. Guaranteed your joy will be short-lived because you've bound it to things that are short-lived. If you want to find simcha, you have to dig deeper inside your soul and start asking yourself the question, why am I here? Am I doing something to fulfill my purpose in life? It doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to start thinking in that direction. That's what this Yom Tov is about. So now to go back to the questions that were asked, the different questions. When people say, I'm a negative person, I see always the negative. Yeah, because you've been programmed that way. You've been conditioned that way. You have to realize that's not the natural you. The natural you is a joyous one. To be able to look at the soul inside of everything. And that's what you have to work at. The question that we're asked here, can I, can I be, is enjoying life a contradiction to being a chassid? Absolutely not. The biggest chassid is the ones that enjoy life more than anyone else. It depends what life means and what you mean by enjoying life. If enjoying life is partaking simply in material pleasures, yes, those are temporary ones. And if you think that's a stira to chassid, maybe. Even that's not a stira because we learn we're not told to be deprive ourselves. Now, Baal Shem Tov also taught no asceticism, which is consistent to the other five themes I mentioned. Why? Because in everything there's an asham, everything is an insu tzalaki. So we don't deprive ourselves or refrain ourselves. Obviously it has to be with discipline, it has to be measured and so on. But in everything there's gedusha. I would suggest the reason you don't feel you're having fun is because there's a dissonance between your definition of fun and your definition of sinus. For many people, number one, sinus has become a chore an obligation, a responsibility. So there's a disconnect. There's when I'm enjoying life and then when I'm a chos. You have to recalibrate.
Yamtav. Just like Hashgach Prat is that a, light, a leaf turns over, definitely the birth of a child, the birth of you, any one of us, is chosen, hand-picked by God and sent to this earth. So to say that I'm going to lose my identity in the process of serving God is a little ridiculous. He wants your identity. He wants your personality. However, your personality should be a channel, an ambassador, an agent, a divine agent on this earth. That's the key. How to connect your personality and identity that that should become an expression of what God wants, not what you want. And not what others want. Now, there's two steps in the process. I discussed this much earlier in the episodes, in the early episodes of my life, episode one, two, how you reconcile bittel and self. It's not a contradiction, based on what I've just said. The contradiction becomes when we become consumed and addicted to ourselves and our needs. And then that becomes the, 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 the driving ethos. Then, of course, anyone that tells you to do something right away, hey, it's not what I want to do. Kabbalah sale can be fun. Yes, I'm stating that for the record. When you understand what it is, Kabbalah sale does not mean punishing yourself. It doesn't mean oppression. It means recognizing that you're not self-made, that there's someone put you here, and that you have a purpose, and that you acknowledge that purpose, and you're accountable to the purpose. Why does it taste sometimes bitter? Because we get so used to ourselves, as soon as you have to do something that's not about self, hey, Everybody wants to be free. Obviously, we want to do so-called free, meaning free of any yoke, of any responsibility. But the people who fulfill a responsibility and fulfill a mission are the happiest people on earth, even though it takes work. Yes, everything that's valuable is going to take effort. So it's not going to come automatically. So if you're asking me to have fun without work, yeah, that probably cannot be reconciled with chassidus. Still, we don't judge ourselves and become too severe on ourselves. If you, if, if, you know, we all have, as I said, setbacks. But, but, this, but, but, but this, the, non, the non-contradiction to Chassidus is that you can have a different definition of what means fun and what means enjoyment. Okay. The rational fears written about is the same idea. There's the letter that I quoted back in episode number seven. I would say, I also I address you to four, episodes four and seven, I also spoke a lot about simcha and joy. And there I, I quoted a letter from the Tzamech Tzedek, which I'll just refer to again, the Igris of the Tzamech Tzedek, volume, well it's not a volume, it's one volume, page 322, the two versions of the letter, where the Tzamech Tzedek talks about that sometimes to elicit this inner joy, sometimes you have to behaviorally behave that way. So not, or you may not be in the mood, but if you behave that way, it automatically he says, like his expression used, that the feelings will follow the actions. And he brings a story, the last night of the Alter Rebbe's life, when Soy Shabbos, Simach Sadiq saw that he was already, Alter Rebbe was uh, he was davening Maidim for the Ahmed in Simach Sadiq, and saw the Alter Rebbe was waning so he was, he davened in a very despondent voice the Alter Rebbe did not stop him, after davening after Maidim Famous story, and Alter Rebbe made Havdalah, and a little afterwards was the Stalkus Havdalah Tevis Tov Kufayin Gimel. So some of Tzedek writes that my grandfather Zayd, the I mean, Alter Rebbe, called him over and told him a Teirah from the Magid. That Musa Adam, Musa, the Teirah is on the Pesach that the Mara Adam Lamaila is affected by the Mara Adam Lamata. That when you are sad below, it causes sadness above. When you're happy below, it causes happiness above. This may be the last Torah that Alter Rebbe said, Chaim Chayusi Ba'almadeh. Tremendous lessons can be learned from this. This alone tells you that Simcha itself is not just, as I said, a, another element. It itself is the secret to happiness. That one behaves that way, they elicit the natural joy of, this, of the soul, and that in turn elicits Simcha from above. Where God forbid a person is negative, you elicit Dinim, because it's a mirror image. We have that power. The Magad has a different a Torah different on the similar idea, and Da Malamaila is Mimach. So usually you say, Da Malamaila Mimach, know that which is above you. He says, Da Malamaila, that which is above, Mimach comes from you. So our behavior affects the behavior with us. When you have a sour face, you elicit a sour face, also from above. When a person has severities and negativity, it brings negativity upon them, God forbid. 
So the power of Simcha is tremendous in opening up doors, in, 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 in accomplishment, as we see. People who do things joyfully at work, at home, in any given situation, elicit in other people. Everybody's smiling. When someone's sour, someone's bitter, what, what kind of reaction do people don't want to be around someone who's bitter? Okay. Um, I believe I answered most of the questions, or all of them. And uh, it's really all about Aveda, but here you have Aveda what to do on Sukkot. So Sukkot isn't just about gathering together, saying L'chaim, Simchus Beis HaSheva, dancing, all that's great. It's working on yourself to find out what real joy is, what your identity is about, and celebrating your own self, and finding others that celebrate with you. We come together to celebrate the fact, Zman Simchaseinu. Simchaseinu is Lashon Rab, and the Alter Rebbe Taitches, and Yismach, Yisrael Ba'esov and Yismach Hashem Ba'maisov. God is celebrating with what He created with us. Isn't that good enough reason to celebrate? And Yismach Yisrael Ba'esov and Jews celebrate that they were created. So Simcha Sainer is a mutual joy. We elicit the joy from above and it's a mutual Simcha in the deepest possible way. And when you look at this and you understand purpose in life and you understand all the levels starting from uh, Sukkot Shemini Atzeres is Ano Malkabul Chedei you're sitting alone with God. That's a great reason to celebrate. Let us now go to another question, which is a little sadder question, but also relates to this entire topic. And that is, coping with grief. Dear Rabbi, I lost my 29-year-old son two years ago to a sudden death. He was shot in his home and it was never fully investigated. I did contact the uh, attorney's office, Pima County attorney's office, and asked them to reinvestigate. They were, then not, they were not of any help. I've had his many boxes of belonging in storage for two years, and I am now having to sort through them and give them away because I do not have a place to store them any longer. And my children want me to take care of this. This is so painful. Every time I give away some random thing, I think about it for days, no matter how small an item or even of low association, I think of how I will never see that item again, and it represented him to me. With everything I sort through, I feel overwhelmed, and the grief is so heavy for me to manage. Losing him suddenly was so painful, but the authorities not fully investigating the people who were in his very small house, and about 20 feet from where he was shot, said they heard nothing and knew nothing, and the Tucson, Arizona Police Department left it at that. Please advise me how to get through this most difficult time. I pray for God's guidance and keep working on this, but it's so overwhelmingly painful to me. for me. I'm currently in graduate school, and he was the youngest of my children. Okay, you may be wondering why I would read this a few days before Sukkot. Well, first of all, as I've pledged here, that I would always be, read things uncensored. People should have the right and the ability to express themselves, even if it's a painful topic, and may make, make, make some of us uncomfortable. But there's another reason, a more personal reason, and this is something I've shared in public and uh, I think a tremendous lesson from the Rebbe in this regard. You know, one of the great things of Chassidus and the Rebbe is that not only they give us direction when things are going well, they also give us direction when things are challenging. And uh, even though no one should ever know of such stories, grief, loss, in any possible way, but it happens. And Sukkot has an answer for this too. The year was Sukkot Tov Shalamid, Second day of Sukkot, a uh, young woman in this community in Crown Heights passed away, tragically, losing, leaving five children, a grieving husband, family, the whole community was shaken up because it was a small community at the time, and every loss, but especially one of a 37-year-old young woman, young mother. And when her husband went over to the Rebbe, second day of Sukkot, to tell the sad news, share the sad news, what I, heard the Rebbe said, what I heard was that the Rebbe said to him, was, Vice days, Amadaf, Venen, Besimcha. Because it's the second day of Sukkot. Yerom said Shiva, the mitzvah of Simcha is there. Shiva doesn't begin in that situation until after Sukkot. And as a real chassid and soldier, that's exactly what he did. We all know we go on Taluchas, Shmini Atzeres night. 
before a kofis, to help him pray Prabha kofis and other shuls, then come back to the Rebbe's kofis. So that's what he did that year, Tavshin Lamed. The year would be 1969. So we're talking about exactly 45 years ago. Lamed to Ayin Hay, right? 30. Second day of Sukkot. He took his family, his children, went to a shul and danced without any hagbolas on limits. To the point that there was a father and son there, part of the part of the congregation. The son said, "Who's this man dancing?" She says, "A man. He just lost his wife." And to which the boy said, "How does he dance like that?" He says, "That's a chassid. A chassid dances." The Rebbe told him to dance. He's dancing. Then he came back to seven seven. He dropped off his children, went to the fabreng, and the Rebbe fabreng that night. Not leil shmirat says. We're talking shmirat says, but by night the leil sim chastera. I should have corrected myself. He came to the Fabrengen, and he was the one that used to start the Nagunim. The Rebbe finished the Sikha. He began to sing the famous Nigan, like Sidim, a Russian song with the words in Russian that says, not fire can destroy me and not water can, can, can annihilate me. When the Rebbe heard him start singing, the tune goes, ay, 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 and continues again and again. The Rebbe looked at him, Jumped up, I heard from witnesses that the Rebbe never danced like that, his whole Nasius. Pasha dancing, Mamish jumping, and everyone understood the meaning, and the whole place was rocking. A simcha that came completely from tears. It was not a simcha because of Sukkot alone, but it was a simcha that, that was somewhere, somewhere able to find it in the Neshama. How one has the power to do that, I'm not going to go explain here, I don't have any idea. But that's what a neshama is. That when he hears from a Rebbe, this is what you do, this is what you do. I, you're crying inside in such a tragedy. You're crying because naturally we cry. But then you're told that now's the time to simcha. Not simcha to go into escapism and forget and make believe like it never happened. No, that's not what the the vart is. Pum the opposite. It's a simcha because your neshama is still connected to God and even the soul that was taken from you is still connected. And as hard as it may be, that's what you have to elicit then. That's the healthy thing to do. And being a true chassid, he heard the Rebbe, and that's what he did. And I, I, would, with, with, I, I didn't do any studies on it, but I guarantee that this probably is the best catharsis and healing in the long term. At the moment, it may look like, like insane. What do you mean? At this moment, you're supposed to be sitting shiva. But Taita says, you don't sit shiva, Sukkot. Taita says, Taita chesed. Abraham says, says, no. I doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense, but some higher force says that's the way it is. And if you embrace it, even if it doesn't make sense to you, he was able to build a beautiful family, a joyous family, not a family broken or bitter. And maybe it was because he was able to overcome his own revealed anguish and express it through joy those days of Sukkot. So it's, yes, it's tears and joy altogether. But this is a Simcha Shal Mitzvah. We're not talking about simcha shal halalus. We're not talking about a guy just decides you're only going to get himself drunk, intoxicated, and I'm going to dance. No, it's a simcha, a mitzvah of sukkahs, a mitzvah of tera, a hero from the Rebbe. And that gives us chust for family to be built, a healthy family, and so on. The end of the story, some of you may know, is that years later, that son, that little boy that saw the dancing, grew up, called Siva Sashem, wanted to sponsor Something for, for children, needy children, children who have lost their parents. Something for sukkahs, for a simcha dika event, a fabrengen, a mesibe. Long story short, when he was asked why, why do you want to do that? He said, he'll pay whatever you, it costs. He said, because I was a little boy and I remember a man that came into my shul on simcha's day at night and danced like that. And I asked my father, and he told me that's a chassid. I said, I never forgot that. And I made a pledge that they will come when I can do that for anyone that children, I will do it. So that's another perpetual effect. These things are forever. So in a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, the pain may not be remembered, but this affects families that are built, the influence that it had on this fellow, the influence that it has on other children, the things we do in the, with, with the energy of the grief and we turn it into simcha, azedim bedima, berinu yuktseru, that lasts forever. 
So as, as hard as it is for it to understand, but it means you give away your tears to a higher power and allow that power to infuse you with what you need to do positively and build and build and build. And it shouldn't surprise anyone because this is what Jews are about. What happened after the Holocaust? There's plenty to cry. Six million Jews, you know how many tears we should be shedding for every life lost, let alone so many. And yet Jews figure out a way to build because we build, we cry and we build. Why I wanted to mention this? Because some of us, all of us should only know simchas, but some people may be suffering. I wanted, just, I wanted to address and show that sukkahs is also for them. And maybe this story in Tav Shalom, it can help many of us. Every one of us have our moments, but uh, above all, going back, obviously it's not for everyone particularly this, this, this extreme, but since there may be some people, I wanted to address that as well. With a few minutes left, I want to talk about one more final question that was asked. Moving along, I know a little hard to transition from that, but we have to move forward. So, L'chaim enforcement of four shots. Okay. So now Sukkot is coming. Sukkot is a time when people say L'chaim, and they fabreng, and so on and so forth. And uh, the question on the table is, okay, we know that Rebbe made a Literally, the date was Pasha Shmini, Shabbos Pasha Shmini, Tov Shen Chov Gimel, 1963, that someone should drink, not, people should not drink more than four small cups until age 40. There were times that Rebbe took the Gzeda off, which now is not the point to go into discussing it, all those times, but there were. But that's when the Rebbe took it off. So here's one question asked. If the Rebbe clearly made a Gzeda, four shot glasses of Mashka, why don't people listen to it? How do I politely and safely survive an all night for bringing when people tell me, Nu, Zog Lechayim? If I respond that I already said four, I sound like a fool. Well, this is sad commentary because the people, Chzizashin, dedicated to the Rebbe, and in this series, people have been lax. So I want to refer you back to an episode, I spoke about this back in uh, episode 9, quoting an Igris Kedish from the Rebbe, in Tovshin Yud Gimel. That means 10 years before the Gzeda, the Rebbe already wrote a letter to Peretz Smotchkin. It's printed in volume 7, page 58, in the Igris Kedish. Where the Rebbe makes it very clear with reasons, not just a Gzeda, a cause of some type of Super rational decree. Reasons why Mashka was done then and, and, and today it cannot be done. So I feel obligated to reiterate the Rebbe's Gzeda. There's no question it stands strong. And uh, just briefly, what I said back then in episode 9, and you can check it out there more at length if a person's worked on himself and with Yiddish Shamayim, Arbet Avzich his whole life, and then says a Lachayim on a Purim or a Sunchosteir or a Sukkis, it's one thing. But for it to become an end in itself, well, God forbid, even before the Gzeda, it was never that way. The Gzeda made it very clear. It's not about indulging yourself and drinking. We're going to a party, I'm going to drink. God forbid, that was never the way the, Re- the Chassidim ever did it. You're talking about people, Arbet Avzich, Bittl, Yerush Shamayim. The Chaim was meant to take away some of the Sirchis, some of the adhesions, the scars of the Nefesh Abamis, that Shepherds Chetzu, that Klaps Chetzu, that sticks itself, glues itself, adheres itself to our beings. So it loosens it a bit, it like weakens, like, like Mashkin Behema, like the Rebbe Rasha. But even then, Chassidim knew it was Ekeldik. So to go to a party and say, oh, I like this Mashka, I don't like this Mashka, that alone is opposite of the whole Kavanah. It's not some type of end in itself. And someone that says, I'm going to find spiritual high through alcohol, that is absolute, that's a Vedazara in a way. Spiritual high you find through serving God, through doing mitzvahs, through learning chassidus. If you need to take off the sikhs, that's what chassidim did, and they knew how to do it. Today, for the reasons that Rebbe explains in that letter from Chavshin Yud Gimel, again, I refer to you, volume 7 in Igris, page 58. The date is Ches Kislev Tavshin Yud Gimel. That, the Rebbe explains. So I think it's important that everybody understand, hear this. Check it out yourself. This is not my own. Chidushim here, Kamuvah Nepashat. And we have to look at Simcha as an opportunity, as a tool to purify our souls, to connect. And sometimes, if your person is going to be over and say, I'm going to have Simcha or I'm going to take Mashke, opposite the Gzeda of the Rebbe, exactly the opposite of the story I just told about that Chosid the soldier that danced when no one else in the world would dance. And that gave him the power. 
to go ahead and say I'm going to get Simcha by doing something the Rebbe said not to do, I don't exactly see how that's going to add in At the end of the day, his kashrus, his kashrus means connecting to what the Rebbe says. I will say, well, you're smarter than the Rebbe. The Rebbe didn't know uh, all this Chacham, So we have to be very careful. Take four cups, at minimum, small cups. The, the minimum cups, that's what I meant, the small cups, as the Rebbe said. And, and, and think about the Rebbe, and think about how you connect to the Neshama. That alone is what gives Simcha, when you connect to what matters. Not through substances, and not through being dependent on substances. This is, uh, this is essentially to the point what the Rebbe said, and the Rebbe said he gives all the keiches that you can reach the highest spiritual heights, sukkas and shminatzeres and simchas teva, through doing what the Rebbe says you should do. I believe I covered the topics that were promised to be covered. Just make sure. Let me go through the lists here. Um, let me just sum up then as we approach sukkas and sum up these points. Each of you, each of us, every person, know you have a direct line to the source itself. God put you here. Every second you're alive is a machadish betuvi b'chol yem tov in my separation. This is even about the creation, let alone about a neshama. It means that God wants you here now, wants you here this sukkis, wants you here this year, many healthy years to come, for, to live up to a, a purpose for which you were sent. Unfortunately, our attention has been hijacked and kidnapped by all kinds of forces. Just ask yourself, how often do you think about what God wants of you and what your mission in this world, your shlichus and the Rebbe shlichus in this world, and how much do you think about your own needs and what you think makes you happy? That alone is already a good study in contrast. So if you're able to connect to that type of purpose, that's where real simcha will come from. No question. And this can help overcome challenges at home, challenges in marriage, challenges at work, challenges in our general psyches and attitudes in life, because it's the, a sense of belonging, sense of knowing I was sent here. Think of it this way. If you're called in by the Rebbe personally and said, I go ahead and do this and this thing, this is the reason you came down to this earth. If you're called by God, God called you in and spoke to you personally and said, this is what I want you to do. What greater joy is that? You know you're fulfilling the purpose of your existence. So in 20, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, you look back and say, I did what I was told to do. I, did, I fulfilled why I was sent to this earth. I don't want to talk about the opposite, the negative approach. Let's talk only the positive. This is where Simcha comes from. So may all of us celebrate Zman Simcha Seinu, the connection is Simcha Seinu, it's a mutual Simcha joy between us and the divine. How we celebrate below causes God smiling to us, which opens up more channels of brachas. So it's a, a, a cycle. It can be a vicious cycle of a negative. It can be a vicious cycle of positive. A type of ripple effect from above to below and from us to others. You smile to others, you generally get a smile in return. And those that don't smile in return, that's their problem. So in general, we should be able to connect to that type of attitude. The Ebrisha should help us. If we do a little ma'at lamata, you do a little let's b'ktana, if you do a little measure below, you'll get far more like that from above. And it should be a very blessed sukkah, simchus, asimcha. We should have much to celebrate about in a revealed way. And all the yom and and everything that we achieved, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, like it says, where you can achieve Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur through tears, you achieve sukkah, or shminat seres, and simchus teda through joy. The same thing. Because as I began, that's the left side. It's also tachas l'reshi. It's also part of the embrace. And yemini tichapkeni, the right hand you embrace, now it comes out begoli in a revealed way. It says, b'kesa layem chagenu. Tiku b'chede shefer. You blow the shefer b'kesa when the moon is concealed. The yem chagenu, it's revealed when the moon is full, which will be this week with sukkahs. Everyone should have a very happy Sukkot. This has been My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 37. Again, to write questions, please go to MeaningfulLife.com forward slash My Life Live. To dedicate an episode or more than one episode, go to MeaningfulLife.com forward slash My Life Live um, forward slash dedicate.php. And again, a happy Simcha and Simcha Dika Sukkot. Until next week, Cholomayd, we will have an episode next Sunday, 8 to 9. 
Kolomet Sukkis, which will be a Prishmin Yatzer Simchus Teda episode, 8 to 9 p.m. Until then, everyone should have a very Simchadika, Meridim Lesimcha, and Zman Simchaseinu. Thank you.